Good evening and welcome to our 2020 Clarion West author event with Shauna McGuire, joined by the Bug Chicks, Christy Reddick and Jess Honiger, and moderated by Samantha Rund. We've been looking forward to tonight's event all year. My name is Marnie Chua. I'm the Clarion West Executive Director, a science fiction fan, and because I geek out about Beatles, I am so pleased to bring you tonight's panelists. Before we begin this event, I would like to acknowledge that Clarion West is organized in Seattle, the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are living through some incredibly disastrous times, from a pandemic to the current wildfires to climate change itself. Events in the world today highlight why speculative fiction is so important in helping people understand what the future could be like and imagine both the positive and negative outcomes. Clarion West's mission is to support emerging and underrepresented voices by providing writers with world-class instruction to empower their creation of wild and amazing worlds. Through conversation and public engagement, we bring those voices to an ever-expanding community. Tonight is a fundraiser for Clarion West. If we inspire you tonight, please consider making a donation. Our donation links are located in the event description. I'd like to thank Tor.com, David George Gordon, The Bug Chef, Bushwick Book Club, Seattle, and songwriter and artist Lucian Lamott for supporting and contributing to tonight's event. Thank you for joining us. I am now going to turn over the panelists' introductions to our event host, Lyle Gowan. Hi, I'm Lyle Gowan. Hi, everybody. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our guests and our moderator, uh, Shannon McGuire, our multiple Hugo and, uh, and Nebula Award-winning author, and Christy Reddick, an entomologist and award-winning lecturer, uh, Jessica Hanna, an entomologist and science researcher, and our moderator for the today, Samantha Run, a comedian extraordinaire. Hi. So I will turn you over to them and uh, enjoy. How did you all first find your interest in, in bugs, and, like become interested? Was it, was it something like ever since you were kids or did it happen a little bit later in life? Donna, do you want to go for that or? or... Hill bugs, um, which I think are a kind of woodlouse, are completely harmless. They're not going to hurt you unless you are made of rotting wood. And they come in purple. And that is the most amazing thing that six-year-old me had ever seen. I used to dig in the mulch out behind our car park and just pick up the biggest, coolest looking pill bugs and fill shoe boxes with pill bugs. <laughs> Finding a purple pill bug was like winning some kind of an award uh, because they were so cool. And the females get yellow spots down their backs when they're gravid. And they actually do become gravid because the eggs will hatch still inside the woodlouse, at least the species that we have in California. So when you flip a female with, big, with yellow spots on her back onto her back and look at her belly, you can see the tiny baby pill bugs moving inside. And that was the worst thing I'd ever seen. And it was incredible. Uh, and this led to me becoming completely fascinated with praying mantises, which are just tiny murder machines. Praying mantises are magic. California, it turns out, is a great place to accidentally incubate 70 praying mantis awaithqua in your third grade classroom. And then you get to have praying mantises on every flat surface in the entire classroom when you come back from the weekend. And that's cool. <laughs> were your classmates and teachers, were they just, you know, varying reactions of people super delighted and other people terrified. Oh yeah. I mean, my teacher was less than thrilled with me, especially when the praying mantises started killing and eating each other, which is what will happen if you have a large population of mantises that can't get out and have nothing else to eat. But we wound up with six mantises that ate all the others and each of them claimed a section of the room. And that was how I learned that praying mantises are territorial so you can have more than one in the same space if they just have enough room. And uh, those six mantises lasted until almost the end of the year when mating season hit. Aunt Bonnie, who had the corner nearest to our teacher, turned out to be the only female mantis in the room. And the other five were drawn by her irresistible pheromones to sacrifice themselves to her one by one. 
That is now Mountain View Elementary has a rule against praying mantises on campus. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and the way that you put that, of course, you're this amazing writer. But I was just thinking, what an incredible dating app for them to come and sacrifice themselves one for one, <laughs> like for somebody's profile. Oh boy. But um Yes, and actually for Christy and Jess, can I ask you that question as well? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was terrified. I didn't really like bugs at all when I was growing up. Um, I, I pill bugs a little bit. Yeah, right? yeah, pill, bug, pill bugs were always like a little benign. And, and like for me, I didn't care about them. You know, I, I grew up fairly rural, so they were everywhere. And it wasn't like super special. It's kind of like seeing squirrels in the backyard, <laughs> you know? Um, but I, I'm with Christy. I didn't like spiders when mm -hmm. I was younger. Yeah. Um, but uh, then uh, we had both of us separately had super amazing professors in, in college that just completely turned our outlook on them around. So, yeah. you know, and, and I think, you know, mine is sort of a tale of two teachers, right? Mm -hmm. So I had, I grew up as a dancer and an actor and, uh, and I was on stage all the time as a, as a child, like, like dance competitions and acting, you know, and all of that. And, and so my life was in sort of an, an area where you didn't see a lot of bugs all the time. And um, so I was pretty afraid of spiders, didn't really like them, I definitely had a bad experience where one <laughs> crawled on a nightlight at the foot of my bed and it like cast a shadow like Aragog at the foot of my bed and I was frozen. And all I remember from that time is like begging my sweet sister who was more terrified than I was to go get my dad. and. And I was lying on my back and like hot tears rolled out of my eyes and into my ear holes, like hot <laughs> tears in your ear holes. Like you remember that. And so <laughs> me and spiders, we were not pals. But then, you know, I had always dreamed of studying large mammals in Africa. And, um, and I, I, once I got my BFA in theater, I was 20, 21. And I thought, God, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do it. I've got to get mm. to, to East Africa and study large mammals. And I went back to school actually for a second bachelor's. And the only classes that were available were chemistry or entomology. And I had failed chemistry in high school. So I was like, <laughs> well, I'm not going to do that. And I didn't know what entomology was. I just heard ology and knew that it was something about living creatures. And I was like, I'll do that one. And my professor, Dr. Tim Yoho was, he just, he looked a bit like a praying mantis actually. <laughs> like he had these big kind of fish goggles that like were Coke bottle, you know, lenses. Like Coke <laughs> bottle lenses. And he had a toupee that was sort of always on slightly differently, like each day, you know, and he, but he was just the sweetest man and so enthusiastic and he really lit something inside me. And so my second semester, when I went to Kenya, I loved the large mammals that I was studying, but it was the bugs that did it for me. And I met a camel spider and that well, was it. And you, and Christy got derailed too. I'm going to oh. have you do the story. She got derailed too, because um, yes. what you mentioned, the tale yes, of two yes, teachers, yes. like, because you loved science. I loved science. And she was dissuaded from it from another teacher when she was younger. Eighth grade, Mrs. Stone. I'm going to call her out. Um, <laughs> I had to test into ninth grade marine biology and I loved whales and I wanted to be in this marine biology class. And she said, you have no aptitude for science. Why don't you stick with dance mm -hmm. and theater and do what exactly. you're good at? And so I just thought, oh, I can't do that. So I will go do what I'm good at and what I'm supposed to. And I loved being on stage. I love it. But it wasn't what really burned inside me like it wasn't the thing and then when i met a camel spider mm. in east africa love at first sight exists like it happened to me and it was midnight and i had my bug net from one entomology class and i heard a <laughs> scream from a dude and i was like that's a spider scream. Like, you know, when it's <laughs> and I like grabbed my net and I was like, don't worry, Harry, I'm coming. And I ran over to the shows, the bathrooms and this thing that was about this big, about maybe five inches in diameter with legs. And at quick glance, it looked like it had 10 legs. Um, and I thought I discovered like a new kind of animal and I went to get it and it ran up 
uh, to my eye height and it like raised its legs and it raised its mouth parts open like this. And they have these hairs on the inside surface and they rub together and they hiss, scream at you. And that was it. I was like, I've got to study these. This is, this is what I'm going to do. So that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a camel spider specialist. I went back and lived in Africa and my, how the times have changed. Spiders. I know. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, just, just hope for anybody who has a fear of spiders from how you overcame that initial Aragog fear. To yeah. Or now. I really think that if you learn about the things that you're afraid of, you turn fear to fascination. Mm -hmm. I think fear and fascination are very closely yeah. linked. It's why we love to get scared, right? Mm -hmm. It's why we love to read, to have that page turning book or to be in that movie theater. And we love that crackly, like tension and anxiety and insects give us that if we, if we allow ourselves to kind of observe and then you can get interested. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, do you have, um, do you have a favorite uh, bug? Like, I mean, I, of the spider, is it like a specific spider or? Well, I got to name a species, which was pretty cool. And I'll bring, I'll pull that up. But Jess, why don't you tell your your favorite spider while I find a picture? My favorite or your, spider? Sorry, your favorite animal, I whatever you want. I favorite spider. Well, I mean, what I, I do. I kind of love jumping spiders, them all the same. But... Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I, I really like, um, so at the moment I'm torn between bullet ants and dung beetles. I love dung beetles mm. because a, they're super cute and B they are super helpful, but also, but then also like bullet ants are like super intense and, uh, they have really powerful stings and they're, they're big. They're like an inch, maybe a little over an inch long and like hairy and iridescent and they like you know take nobody's crap and it's <laughs> yeah. wonderful and they have marauders that go out mm -hmm. at night and and try to find food and bring it back to the yeah. nest and as you're walking along in the rainforest at night we've had this happen in costa rica and in peru y you can see them from far away like they're so yeah you, yeah, you can see them from them. like from like 50 feet 100 feet away yeah. you're like oh there's a, there's, there's a bullet ant over there's there there's a giant bullet ant yeah if you know what to look for you can see them from far they're away they're that big they're beautiful <sighs> well it sounds like any one of them would be a great character in a book or a movie if yeah. you had to pick one that was going to be a star of a next movie what would it be i mean I'm always tempted to say camel spider. Now I'm like boring, right? I'm like, oh, only camel spiders. But actually I would only want a camel spider to be in a book or a movie if it wasn't fear mongering. If it were the hero. Yeah, I have a real issue with fear mongering mm -hmm. in any kind of media about arthropods. Um, I just think it's banal and and it's just not, there's, there, there, <sighs> these animals have shaped human culture. Arthropods have shaped human culture and will continue to shape human culture well, and evolution. And we're incredibly reliant yes. on them. Like if they weren't here, neither, like we wouldn't be here either. Yeah, and I, and I think they're such great inspiration mm -hmm. for like, there's so many sci-fi characters mm -hmm. and aliens and creatures that have inspiration from them, but I would hate to see like an actual yeah. camel spider be sort of vilified because they're already quite vilified. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but yeah, I love the characters that people create where I can go, oh, they took that from a parasitoid wasp or, right. oh, they took that from, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, like the Sarlacc pit, that's like an antlion pit. Right. And, and so I love those things where if you're in the know scientifically, you can be like, oh, this is from this. Like, I love that kind of stuff. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Like the inside jokes or the, right. Mm -hmm. the yeah. And I have to ask, um, well, I want to ask Shannon as well. Do you have like, um, obviously I, I caught the praying mantis and then the, the purple bugs as well for you, but, and then of course you've written about the tapeworm. Do you have a favorite I as mean, well? Tapeworms are not actually insects. They're oh. from a different phylum. Okay. Um, I love tapeworms. <laughs> I'm like, whoops, I, I'm like, I, I'm being educated. <laughs> no, it's okay. I love tapeworms. I even have favorite tapeworms, but they are not insects. Um, if I can't pick a praying mantis, because mantises are my favorite bugs, uh, quite often, they just make me happy. Uh, yeah. They're great. I'm going to go with luna moths. You know, Ooh, good I choice. Live where lunas are. I have a friend who breeds them. Mm -hmm. um, she she gets like 80 every year, and this year has been awful because she breeds them for educational purposes. You'll probably buy some from her at some mm -hmm. now that mm -hmm. you're in a space where they're native, 
so it's not importing invasive insects. Uh, but this year, because of when the schools shut down for COVID, mm -hmm. we wound up with just cages and cages of Luna moths with nowhere to go. And she's not going to release them all to die. She's going to keep them to get the eggs so that we get another generation. But mm -hmm. we have pictures of her covered head to toe in Luna moths, just like, look at me, I can fly. Um, moths are some of the most charismatic insects. They're just beautiful. They're great to look at. You know, all moths are butterflies. Not all butterflies are moths. Um, and I find that butterflies get all of the good press because the majority of the moths we see are the little brown ones that my cat likes to eat. But <laughs> if you're actually digging, I think that things like the rosy maple moth are pretty mm. than just about any butterfly you're going to find. Yeah. They're just gorgeous. And if I were going to stick a bug in a movie, it would be the spiny, the spiny Australian leaf insect, the spiny oh, Australian yeah. stick, because they are ludicrous. They are stupid bugs that have no reason to exist. <laughs> stick bug that can get to be about yay big. They eat fucking everything. Like they're illegal because if they get out, they'll just go eat everything. All the foliage. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. They, if it's a leaf, they'll, they'll chow it down. They reproduce parthenogenically for up to 10 generations after the last sexual copulation. They are covered in tiny spines. If you upset them in any way, their first big defense mechanism is to hunker down and rub themselves on you. It's like attack exfoliation. Huh. The spines are not sharp or long enough to do any real damage. So unless you are one of the one person in 6 million who's allergic to spiny Australian stick insects, all it's going to do is irritate you a little. It's like being sanded. Mm. Your second big defense mechanism, if sanding you doesn't work, is to go, oh, I'm a stick. And just hold perfectly still for up to 20 minutes being a stick. Yeah. And if you piss them off further, and this is the point where they become a bullshit insect that has no reason to exist because they're from Australia. How are they still alive in Australia? Is to produce a smell that is strangely reminiscent of a hipster smoking a cigarette meant to smell like a Mrs. Fields cookies. It is this weird baking cookie smell. Um, I had a highly illegal colony of them because I didn't know they were illegal when I acquired them, but I had a highly illegal colony of them in my living room for a while. And the first time someone jostled the cage, I thought someone was literally vaping in my house. Oh, wow. So it's a ridiculous sandpaper stick that smells like a hipster party. <laughs> and I would love to see somebody figure out how to put that in a movie and not have folks go, your biology is bad. <laughs> I'd love to see a movie about that. That'd be great. I and wish, I wish I'd wish brought my That's two specimens. <laughs> oh, sorry, Samantha, I just talked over you. No, it's okay. I was just thinking of the great Australian actors that they could choose from for it, you know? <laughs> We'll just cover Bindi Irwin in giant walking sticks. It'll be fine. So um, if, if, if you all had to, uh, if you had a day or an hour, however long that you'd like to be transformed into a bug, what, what would it be? You, you, could, you could live That's a good one. That is a good question. And, and um, you don't have to worry about, you know, being killed in the process. You get, you get your 24 hours, you get to be alive and experience the life of a bug. Which one would it be and why? Oh, my gosh. My whole brain. Camel spider. I know. Just it, it, I know. I'm like, camel spider. <laughs> no, I'm thinking. I just need one of those signs. <laughs> just hold camel spider. Uh, no, I actually was thinking dragonfly. Hmm. <gasps> Um, because they, you know, everybody wants to fly as a superpower, but like, <laughs> I, 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 they, they are, um, they're fascinating. I want to know what they see and actually how, mm. how they process that visual information as they're flying so quickly. That's fascinating to me. Um, they move all four wings independently of each other. They can, they're the only uh, other animal besides, um, hummingbirds that can fly, uh, they can, they can hover and, and go backwards. Um, they're, they're just, mm -hmm. they're incredibly fast fought flyers. They're predators. I really like predators. I'm really into predators. Um, yeah. A dragonfly. I, I, I never think... realized that they were, I never realized they were predators. Great mosquito control. Oh yeah, they're eating those mosquitoes. Yeah, yeah. they're chowing them down at mm -hmm. sixty miles an hour to the to the dragonfly. 
if we extrapolate. Yeah. They're, they're, they're <laughs> little, they're little mosquito hunters. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be a jumping spider for me. Ooh. I would, I think that would be super, super awesome. Jumping spiders, um, have depth perception, the mm -hmm. kind of, you know, I mean, in a simpler way that humans do, but it functions for the same purpose. And, uh, you know, and if they miss, they've got a bungee cord of silk that they just kind of catch themselves with, which also sounds super interesting to me. Yeah. <laughs> and they do really elaborate yeah. mating dances. I mean, and I'm an amazing dancer. Like, I, don't know you, you know, I don't know if you know this about me you or not. You truly are. It transcends through the Zoom. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. It might, it might actually would be the only time in my life that I had any sort of rhythm. <laughs> so. That's amazing. And what... Where are the jumping spiders? Like? Everywhere, all, all over the place. Yeah, there's there's different species everywhere. Um, I think, am I right in thinking that the highest living altitude wise is on arthropod Everest? on Everest is a kind of yeah. jumping spider? Yeah. Yeah. And they balloon the same way that or weavers do. Oh, right? they do. So, spiders fly. Yeah. So what they do when they're when they're really small, they will they have a special like um thickness and tensile strength of, of silk that they produce and they produce a long string of it and it catches in wind currents and it will pull them up way up high into the air and take them across like ridiculously vast distances. They are often the first animals to pop populate a new island. Mm -hmm. Spiders are the first things yeah. because of these air currents. Um, uh, yeah, they just, yeah, they just ride the wind and they when, can, you know, Whenever I'm in an airplane, I look out the window and think about like all the baby spiders that are at that altitude in the high <laughs> air. Oh. So like flies by your window. I'm just... never going to be able to, to not think that on a plane. I hope, you know, you're welcome. It's a good, thank you. <laughs> just kidding. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, Common, how about for you? I mean, since it appears that we're playing an arthropoda, Mm -hmm. means that we've got all of pan crustacea to play with and i'm actually going to go with the mantis shrimp it's not an insect oh. the crustacean so they deviate at the subphylum level but they can see colors we can't even imagine so if i got to spend a day as a mantis shrimp i would come back with my mind literally changed forever because i could remember colors that i don't even have the neurons to picture mm. Plus, I could punch yeah. stuff to death, which would yes. be fun. They're yeah, at the speed of sound. At the speed speed of they, when they punch, they literally get convection waves. They collapse the water. It's amazing. They're amazing. Wow. And you know, Shannon, because you love uh, you love roly polies, you love isopods. The the largest isopods on the, the planet, giant isopod the, the mm -hmm. giant one they're like the size of a loaf of bread and yeah, they they're live so good down in the depths of the ocean and um we know a guy down in uh He's in louisiana i think uh mississippi i think at the, at the very southern tip of mississippi and he runs lumcon and he has submarines where he goes and he ro ro robotically goes and finds them at the bottom of, I know. And he has freezers full. Freezers full. Do you want to go with us? Let's yes, go. I do. Okay. <laughs> Giant roly polies. We're going to nerd out so oh, hard. Man, this is so good. <laughs> I love giant aquatic isopods. They are so good. Yeah. yeah they're so bizarre. Punch if I were a mantis shrimp. They replace the tongues uh -huh. of, of fish. Called, There's a really um, terrible yeah. horror movie about that called The Bay. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it needed to commit and it does not commit. That's disappointing. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Does he eat the giant undersea isopods? Sorry. Um, he does have a freezer full of them because he studies them for science, but he definitely does uh, do a lot of observing as well with his submersibles. So he doesn't kill everyone he sees, but definitely oh, yeah. he, he collects. Yeah. yeah. But if he's got a freezer full, I have to say, if I had a freezer full of giant isopods, the urge to pop one in a lobster pot would overcome me at some point. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder if it's the same deal where you have to do it um, when they're alive, not to go like in a super dark 
sure. you know, yeah. direction there. But I, I wonder if they have that same kind of like, if you, if you eat them once they're dead there, they no. have like a, like a toxin or yeah. something. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I wonder oh, if you eaten one. Because well, I would have eaten one by now. Sure, of course. And you Science. know, um, <laughs> we, we know the bug chef and sometimes he has done um, almost like you would put pine nuts into like an aromatic rice dish or something. He has done some isopods in mm -hmm. some rice dishes, like just for some crunch. The little ones you don't get much meat from, but because they are, though lobsters are kind of bottom feeders and decomposing. Yeah. I don't know that it would be that different. That's yeah. fascinating. We should think about that. I want to know what they taste like. Yeah, what totally. Exactly. Is an isopod again? It's uh, like a giant It's like a giant roly poly. Oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> but oh, that's all right. And a giant roly poly. <laughs> yeah, there's a giant roly poly at the bottom of the ocean. Yep. And there's a company in Japan that makes really realistic plush versions. Oh, so I've got one the size of my torso. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Our friend at Purdue has a plastic one that is 3D printed that rolls up into a ball and the ball is this big and then unrolls and it's perfect. It's yeah, perfect. she she showed it to us. We we went there um, to film with some of the stuff, some of the specimens and and live animals that she had, and she was like, "Hey, let me show you this." And then she holds it out, and literally we screamed. There were people down the hall like, "What's going on? Who is that?" <laughs> is somebody? I want that blueprint. Is that available for download? Someone, you know, we can That's ask her. Interesting. We'll ask her. Yeah, we'll, we'll ask, her. ask her. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, so I, I want to ask because uh, the topic of food did come up for just a yeah. moment. And since you are all do have, you know, a special place in your hearts for, for bugs, do you also have a special place in your belly? And does that hurt your heart? <laughs> what, what do you think about um, this idea that uh, perhaps, you know, as humans, we need to start eating more bugs to help save our planet? Mm. Yeah. Have you ever spent any time with a chicken? Um, no. They're really friendly. They have distinct personalities. They're incredibly sweet. Like a chicken that has been accl acclimated to humans is a pet. Yeah. Just like a goat or a bunny that's been acclimated is a pet. I would punch you in the throat if you tried to eat asshole because she is my pet. And once you have told something that it's a pet, you've made a moral commitment to not eat it. Mm. But if you want to bake a dish full of giant Indian mantises, I'll happily try that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's a great way to put it. I, I think, you know, we, we have some, we have some animals, like I have eaten tarantula legs, but we have a tarantula mm -hmm. named Beyonce that I, I would run into a burning building for. Like she is, we have had her now for five years. She could live up to 30 more years. She could be with us when we retire as the bug chicks. Like wow. she's, she's part of our family. And so, yeah, I think there is a distinction to be made. Um, and we were talking earlier about unintentional entomophagy, which is where you accidentally eat things or you eat things that are already in cooking. Like mm -hmm. in, a, in a bottle of fruit juice, you are allowed to have five fly eggs by law. Or in a bar of chocolate, you're allowed to have a certain number of pieces of of dismembered insect just because it's like unintentional bycatch of, of mm -hmm. just food processing. But when you set out to eat something, so like I make mealworm tacos, which are primo, but they're the way. really good. I make super worm tacos and we can show you a super worm um, that we have so that you get an idea of what we're talking about. But they're the things that you get in the pet stores that you, like, you feed to like a bearded dragon or something. Right. And uh, so, so it's just having that distinction in your mind. But I, but I do think it is fascinating that insects really could be the next frontier, which is really an old school food because humans mm -hmm. have been eating insects and other arthropods for as long as humans have been right. alive and human humanoid ancestors. Like we, we have been eating these animals. Um, it's, it's one of the first foods as hunter gatherers and, and gathering gathering animals to eat. So, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have a moral quandary with it. I yeah, think I, I, like, I think that, you know, even, even the conversation of a moral quandary, like, like all the animals that are used for food should be treated with, you know, respect and consideration and not mistreated and yeah. not treated with cruelty. Um, 
But, you know, when it comes to bugs, people see them not as animals. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a like very heavily a Western concept. Right. Um, and it, and it ties into, you know, being above all that and like, Oh, well now I'm just going to get like, I'm just going to get beef. Like bugs are dirty and I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not going to associate with that. Whereas something like 75, 80% of the earth's population either relies on insects as a protein source or, um, it is a regular part of their right. diet. It's a regular cultural yeah. part of their diet. And, and so even, even the conversation of, um, you know, is, is it something that is the future or is it something that, you know, we should be doing? It's, it's common everywhere else. And it's just, it's just new for us. Right. Yeah. We're, we're not evolved beyond insects. Exactly. We're going to go grab Beyonce. Do you oh, want to see her? Yay. Yeah. Okay. Beyonce. We're going to grab Beyonce. Yeah, she's right up top. And I'm wondering if, if we're very lucky Sorry, I'm talking away from the microphone. If we're very lucky, we might be able to see her silk. So I'll hold her first in front of this camera. And because we have a light, we might be able to see her silk come out of her mm -hmm. abdomen, which is a pretty special thing. Oh. So this is Beyonce. She is a curly hair tarantula from Honduras originally. She's a she's a captive bred um, tarantula. We don't we don't really get animals that aren't captive bred. We do our very best to only yeah. deal with captive bred insects and other arts. Here, do you want me to hold the tank? Yes. You can. So um, first thing I'm oh going to do. She's got there's she so has, much silk. There's so much silk right I'm now. I'm going to pull this. She is over. a professional. <laughs> she knows she knows what is expected yeah, so here she is hi me... pretty lady she's so beautiful she's fluffy yeah she is fluffy that's those curly curly hairs and then i don't know if you could see some of the silk right there wow. laying down mm -hmm. right here she actually has silk coming out of her yeah. spinnerets right now i can see where it's still connected she to does. her body so i'm gonna grab her well not grab her here's what i'm gonna do i'm, I'm not respectfully take her into christy's hands i'm not one of these wranglers who just like swoops in and grabs mm. um i like to let her know that we're here because she's kind of chilling out right now and she will be she's very active hi sweetie so it's gonna take me just a second to kind of get her walking here into my hands come here oh my gosh and it's warm in this room right now with the mm -hmm. lights so she's going to be quite active arthropods for the most part really wake up and start moving around as it is warmer um and she's no exception to this hi babe here, come mm -hmm. here i'm just gonna give her a little bit of a nudge in that direction come yeah. on darling okay here we go she's got a oh, big geez. abdomen Oh, is she still? Connected? No, that was okay. Inside. All right. So this is Beyonce, and you know we had a group of teenage girls when we first got her when she was younger, and we said, "What? What should we name her? She's fabulous!" And they were like, "Beyonce," and we we're like, "Well, yeah, obviously." Which makes total sense. <laughs> um, so this is her now. This is her abdomen or epistosoma. This, the part where the legs connect to and the head, that is the uh, cephalothorax. Here, let me use this. It's as a kind point. of like the head and the thorax yeah. combined, right? Yeah. Can you tip her down just yeah. a smidge? There we go. Yeah. And then, so the, I don't know if you can see right down here, it looked like little tiny fingers on the end of her abdomen. Those are her spinnerets right there. Yeah. And I'm going to actually show you, I'm going to pull some of this silk out. There we go. She okay. is laying. Do you see that in front of my yeah. face right here? She is laying several strands of silk right now. There, and it just comes out like this. Isn't that gorgeous? Now I'm gonna put this. Jesse, can you switch that camera? I'm gonna yeah. put the silk under the camera first. We're gonna go to our bug cam now. We're gonna do our best. There's some of her hairs. We're coming now over. Her sub there's, there's her, her eyes. eyes. She's looking at us. There's her eight eyes. So tarantulas have eight eyes. Most spiders have eight eyes. Some have six. Most have eight. They're quite simple eyes. They see shadow and light, except for things like jumping spiders mm -hmm. that have those two big sort of bifocal eyes. And then as we move this way, 
Those are her, the tops of her fangs, mm -hmm. also called calissery. I'm going to come over here to her toes. <gasps> oh, have you ever seen a cuter thing in your whole life? Ooh, do this Why one. Why are this one. toes so adorable? Like little. Why? Toes. Look at the little. They just the cutest. Look at her little claws. No idea, but they are like. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, I just you can't know. even handle They're it. They're so cute. So what we're going to do right now is, oh, oh, actually, wait, 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 ooh, ooh. watch this. I'm going to, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to do a bit of a rear end shot here. Everybody go with me. There, those are the spinnerets right, right there. Mm -hmm. That's where the silk comes from. Right in there. Yeah, and what they will do is they will kind of um, weave independently of each other. Um, so they kind of um, undulate on the on the end of her abdomen. And uh, I will show you like this, right? And they weave that silk yeah. between them. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to change my hold on her. So I've still got her like this, but what I'm going to mm -hmm. do is I'm going to put her flat down into the cage and I'm going to do something called cupping where I'm going to take my hand and cup over her like this and scoop her upside down so you can actually see her calissery, her fangs. And you can see her little red lipstick mouth, super beautiful. Tarantulas all have this sort of rosy reddish or pinkish hairs around lipstick. their mouth. Um, and now tarantulas have venom. They are true spiders. All true spiders have venom, though they did discover two recently that are vegetarians, which is quite fascinating. Um, I know we're learning things all the time. All and right. then, um, so they use their venom in order to eat their food. A lot of people ask us, do you de-venom your tarantulas, which they wouldn't be able to eat? All right, okay, now, there you go. I just picked her up and she's hanging out like this. And it's kind of like when you flip over a chicken, they kind of go into a, like a bit of a torpor, mm -hmm. right? So you can see Do you want to put her little thing? And I'll yeah. just hold it still. Let's do the scope. So we're going to go back to bug cam. Give us a second. I got a tarantula in my hand. Here we go. So these are the fangs. Ooh, that yeah. is beautiful. You can see that they are hard and outlined in a hard exoskeleton. So they actually shed the outer layer of their fangs when they molt. So you'll have that hard, shiny outer layer when they molt. And you can see those reddish hairs around the little mouth there. And then we'll bring you kind of down the body. You can see where those legs kind of connect underneath the body. Yeah, but this, and she's just chilling. She's just hanging out. Sleeping. But that is, that's the fangs right there. And you can see at the top of the fang, there's a little bit of white right there. That you see that white kind of crescent? That is um, what is called intersegmental membrane. And so that's important because um, when they have their fangs, their fangs are mobile like this. They can go like this, right? And so they can kind of like get into a cricket or something. Everyone say, bye, Beyonce. Mm -hmm. Hi, Beyonce. Bye, Beyonce. So imagine I'm a spider. Here's my fangs. Here's a cricket. It's hopping. I bite it. Boom. But it's still hopping. It's trying to get away from me. If you can imagine trying to hop something trying to hop away from you, it's difficult to eat, right? It's like a hamburger hopping away from you. So the venom does two things: it immobilizes the prey, it um, sort of paralyzes it, and then it liquefies the inside. Because if you've got kind of two fangs and no real bottom jaw, you can't really chew your food. So they really need it more liquefied and mushy. And so it's kind of like a cricket smoothie. Um, or a cricket milkshake, but they don't slurp it up through the fangs. They actually kind of mush it together and then they have this mouth opening and they slurp and you saw all of those hairs and those hairs act like a little strainer to strain out any of the hard bits of exoskeleton that might be in the cricket or whatever they're eating. So, um, so that's how tarantulas and, and a lot of other spiders eat. They, they, they need that venom to help them externally digest their food. It's almost like our stomachs, but on the outside. So that's why they need that venom. Yeah. You grab me the lid. Yes. 
I love earlier when you were talking about like fear and fascination being like two sides of the same thing. Mm. So learning more, more about the um, insects and, you know, how they function and things that, you know, all of it makes sense the more you learn, but has there ever been anything that you learned that seemed a bit weird? Like <laughs> weird, in a bad way? Yeah, like weird, bad? Oh, huh? Like weird, bad? Well, I don't I know because I, I don't, I don't want it to be judgy because I feel like that judgment comes from a place of not understanding, but yeah. has, have you ever learned something that seemed maybe, I mean, maybe you did initially think it was bad, but then understood it or just seemed a little bit strange. Any mm -hmm. odd sort of insect behaviors? I mean, there are m m millions of <laughs> odd insect <laughs> behaviors. I mean, uh, okay, I'll do, I'll do one that has to do with mating. So, um, Sean, and you mentioned earlier about the, the female mantis and mm. the male mantids. And so, um, in, in common sort of common, uh, I would say public science belief, there is this story that female mantids eat the males. And that comes from a study um, in the in the eighties where they had a bunch of female mantids in a lab, but it turns out they weren't feeding them enough. So when they presented them with the males for mating, there was sexual cannibalism, right? And so it was like, oh my gosh, this is a mantis this behavior. behavior. <laughs> it happened in all of our mantids, but they weren't feeding female mantids enough. They weren't feeding them as much as mm -hmm. a female mantid would eat in the wild. So in the wild, sexual cannibalism still does happen, but um, it's much more rare. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a much more rare occurrence. A well-fed female will allow a male to do a very elaborate mating dance. And if the female does not like the way the male danced, she will not mate with him. There is mate choice, which is kind of fascinating. Um, so there's like mating things, mm -hmm. like there are plugs, like some moths, male moths will plug a female's genitals um, with a glue after they have mated to prevent another male from mating with her, which is basically just genetic security, right? Mm -hmm. That male wants to make sure that his genes mm -hmm. go forward. And it's not like a dastardly you know, like, like whirling of the mustache, you know, like it's not, there's nothing dastardly about it. It's just, it's, it's just, it's just, you know, part of the biology. A dragonfly scoop. This one's, this one might be my favorite. So Jessica and I do these videos where we do mating behaviors of bugs. And there's I'm, no scooping happening though. No, I'm, I'm always the male and Jessica's always the female. And we did dragonflies and Females have their genitals, females have their genitals up here and, and so do males. And so um, even though their tails extend far beyond that. And so um, a male dragonfly will come up to a female and he has a scoop on the end of his penis and he will scoop out other male sperm and flick it away and scoop and flick. <laughs> Showing your face. <laughs> and so we were like, how are we going to film this? Because a lot of kids watch our videos. So um, we had like little hip, hip pouches and with like sperms out of cardboard. Yeah. And we like, yeah, and I took a spatula and like scooped them and flicked them out of her. It was real fun. We have a lot of fun. But, um, but that's, that's a behavior. There are some mating behaviors that are like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Bugs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Bad bugs, indeed. Yes, bad uh, bugs. Beetle penises are like the most amazing kitchen supply store you've ever seen. Everything is a single-use tool. Like, my dick is a cheese grater. Mine is a garlic press. Well, in the case of the bed bug, my dick is an ice pick. Like, they have yeah. basically weapons for penises. And uh, in order to avoid the sperm of other males and make sure that they're the ones that get to impregnate the female, they gave up on the vagina a long time ago and started just impregnating the female from above. They literally penetrate what would be her sternum if she had a skeleton and go for traumatic chest rape in all cases. Mm -hmm. Led to the female vagina. Somehow evolution didn't decide, let's take the dick knives away. Evolution decided, <laughs> let's give her a second fake vagina. It's not a real vagina because it's not actually connected to the reproductive system, but it's right. It'd be like if you had a vagina right between your tits. 
so that a dude could bang you from above and impregnate you by squirting into your uterus from the top. This still penetrates several layers of bed bug flesh. So many female bed bugs die of horrific infection. Sadly, not enough of them because we still have bed bugs to deal with. Um, but yeah, literally all bed bug. <laughs> I'm I'm killing. <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> you're I'm not, not you're wrong. Not, you're not literally wrong. all bed bugs are created through traumatic chest rape of the female. Yeah, traumatic insemination. It's a thing. Yeah. I just have to say, uh, on a side <laughs> note, on a side and professional and personal note, Jessica and I teach. Um, I would say mainly children. Uh, mainly, mainly under 18. <laughs> mainly under 18. Um, and. It is such a joy and an honor and a privilege to be able to be adults and <laughs> um, and be able to share in this today. And I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for having us here. Because we we so rarely get to do this kind adult of stuff that it's really fun for us, and we love it. Yeah. And one of the great joys of the fact that we're all doing this from our homes is that my mother walked in while I was explaining that. <laughs> So uh, the reason I muted briefly is because my mom was in the room going, what the hell, traumatic chest rape? This is the weirdest conversation. <laughs> she has now wandered off muttering to herself oh. about what I'm talking about in here. That's beautiful. <laughs> Yay, Zoom. <laughs> And I just want to thank some people in the chat um, for, for helping there. Yeah, we, we have thebugchicks.com if you want to see some of our videos. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a couple of couple of our mating videos on there. And uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's super fun. We did not do bed bugs. We decided to... I don't you even kind remember of have what have to stab did. somebody to do bed bugs? It was a little too intense, yeah. Um, I mean, those we, videos were for college kids, so were. maybe we could have gotten away with it. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm wondering, because, you know, learning more today, clearly from you all, um, I could see how this can tie into fiction, because some of the stories, without hearing more of why this happened, seem a bit fantastical. Um, so Shauna, has this, how has this informed the building of your worlds for fiction? I mean, thus far, I've mostly done tapeworms. Uh, my bug building has been relatively restrained because I love them. And I feel that if you are a storyteller, you have a certain responsibility not to, not to pull down the Jaws effect. You know, don't demonize real creatures. And if you explain, like bed bugs, I will happily demonize bed bugs. Bed bugs are terrible. I have yet to find any species of anything except for other bed bugs that primarily predates on bed bugs. I think we could wipe them out and not change the food chain at all. Whereas if you killed mosquitoes, you would cause a crash in the bat population, and that would be very bad. Um, you know, short of, of villainizing bed bugs, there's not that much you can do with insects that's not just going to convince somebody that already screams, kill it, kill it, when they see a picture of someone's pet tarantula that mm -hmm. could be kill it and kill it in every spider they see. I kind of love to read books about villainous insects, but whenever I think I'm going to write a book about a villainous insect, I just feel bad. I enjoy them too much to want to make them the bad guys that way. Mm -hmm. Right. That. Yeah. Well, I know. I did. You... Oh, please. sorry. I was going to say, I just finished a book wherein a character winds up with an emotional support spider. Um, there is so much discussion of the lung barrier in that particular book um, because they wind up in another dimension for a while where insects are very, very large, but the square yeah. law is clearly still in effect because everything is not exploding all the time. So there's just a lot of, do you think they have lungs? Have we crossed the lung barrier? That's horrible. And the end result is a jumping spider the size of a cow that comes home with her to our dimension and is now her emotional support spider. His name is Greg. I have been forbidden to remove him from editorial changes to the book. He's great. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Super exciting. That's nice to hear that that you that you feel that way though in, in your writing. Um, yeah, it's it, it's it's a it's a it's a tricky thing because they are um, they're sort of perfect to exploit that fear that that mm -hmm. people sort of innately have. And, and you're right. I mean, we can't we can hardly do anything without some meme of kill it with fire, you know, and. Um, 
and you know, I, that's our work. Like that's our job. That's our job for our lives mm -hmm. is to help people to see them in a different way. And we actually use insects to, to teach um, young people about social emotional learning and mm -hmm. challenging their assumptions of themselves, others, and the natural world. So we teach about bias. We teach about prejudice. We teach about um, we teach about fear and we teach about negative self-talk. We mm -hmm. teach about um, uh, mistaken identity and right. passing and mimicry versus mockery. I mean, we use these mm -hmm. animals to teach lots of young people how to have some strategies and some some different ways of catching themselves in some of those negative thoughts mm -hmm. before they become actions yeah um and well, so that's our newest yeah and and you know invertebrates in general are really good animals to teach about differences and similarities because it you know, there are enough differences for them to be amazing inspiration for things like fiction, but there's also enough similarities to where like our behaviors are not necessarily that different. And empathy is a place yeah. where we can really teach. They become a neutral zone for, for people to learn how to foster empathy yeah. because sometimes if you go if you go to any I don't care how old you are if we if we if we talk about um anything with empathy for others people get really mm, you know I mean defensive we, we've seen this in the world right now we've seen this especially yeah. in our country right now is any kind of empathy for otherness is um is in some ways frowned upon and so how can we how can we think of otherness as, as, as beautiful? Mm -hmm. And this is a way that we can get around. Um, you know, when we say fear to fascination, it's not appropriate to be fascinated with other cultures. You can be respectfully interested with other cultures mm -hmm. and with different kinds of people, and, but, yeah. but being sort of like fascinated, there's like, we don't want to promote exoticism. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because or that can be very negative or then appropriation yeah. where people don't understand boundaries of um, uh, cultural expressions of appreciation. But I think bugs are a great, a great way around that. Mm -hmm. We can, we can use that as a neutral ground. Right. Yeah, I think that's a great distinction because I mean, for humans, we're all the same species. <laughs> so yes, having exactly. a sort of appreciation is a bit different than fascination for like exactly, exactly. Are we the same thing. Yes, we are. Yes, a great way to teach patience because what a lot of people don't realize if they don't interact with them long enough, is that bugs learn. Yeah don't reason the way that we do. They don't have very big brains. They're not very complicated, but you saw how calm Beyonce was when she was being picked up and handled. Yeah. If you just try to pick up a wild spider. You're not going to have that experience. Mm -hmm. And a wild spiny African flower mantis would not just sit calmly on my finger, but these girls have been being handled by me since they were at their L2 instar. So they're all, all at L4 and five. Now they've had several molts of being handled and hand fed and they are used to the idea that I'm not going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. You can do that with most kinds of insect that will not do you severe damage if you slip up. Like, don't try to hand train a black widow, but please feel free to acclimatize a giant African millipede to your presence. Mm -hmm. We'll learn who smells like friendly. Mm -hmm. Watching them develop their personalities you know, this particular mantis that I have on my desk, who I tried to take out a moment ago and was just like, nope, I'm going to stab you. I'm staying in my enclosure. Her name is Asshole because sometimes she does just go, I'm not, I'm going to stab you. I'm not going to come out of my enclosure. Uh, and other times she goes, the enclosure is open. I will be free and runs for the hills. And none of her sisters. <clears throat> they have personalities. They have traits that are not just my species does X. And learning that is an act of patience and commitment. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and also patience for yourself, patience for, um, you know, what are, what are my levels of comfort right now? It's a, it's a, it's a learning process. I didn't immediately, when I thought that bugs were cool after being afraid of them, I had a, I had a 45 minute standoff with the smallest jumping spider you've ever seen for my collection. I fell in love with it. Couldn't kill it for my, for my first insect collection, brought it in a Tupperware and was like, I'm not, I'm not killing it. Like, give me the points or don't give me the points for the collection. 
but I'm setting this thing free. Like I just, I, I spent an afternoon with this thing and I'm not going to kill it for the collection. And is your new roommate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now that, that doesn't mean that we don't have a large number of specimens, mm -hmm. but our work is teaching. And, and sometimes you need to show something that is dead and still before you graduate to living because I want someone to get to get really interested in the morphology, mm. the body parts and the colors and the and the shapes and, and what they can do. If I if I initially bring out something that's moving for people who are a little freaked out, they're so focused on where is it gonna go, what is it gonna do, is it going to hurt me? Their focus is on them that their focus will not be on learning about the animal. So you need to do- Which is often where problems come in right, anyway. Right, so we do sort of a scaffolded approach. Yeah. We start with talking, then we move to dead animals, then we move to live animals, then we move to holding and petting, and then we move to the animals that you are not allowed to hold and pet until you are 24 and have Yeah, and, and Sean, and that speaks to your point too, yeah. when you were talking about the mantids, about how the ones that are kept in captivity and aren't necessarily going to strike you if you pick it up versus one that you find in the wild. Um, you know, there, I, I think that something that people should learn too, is that there is, a is that respect extends beyond not just, um, you know, like smashing something just cause you are afraid of the way it is, you know, it, it extends to, Oh, well, you know, I don't know anything about this animal. And so I'm just going to watch it or leave it alone. Yeah. And Shannon, I was curious with um, some of the patients and just um, accepting the, the bugs for what they are and learning about them, how that has also informed your writing, um, that mindset, not necessarily that you're always writing about bugs, but how, how has that mindset helped you explore different worlds? I mean, I love bugs, but I did not study them in college. I was a dual major in folklore and herpetology. And the study of reptiles and amphibians has a lot in common with the study of bugs because you spend a lot of time just watching them to see what they do. And that's mm -hmm. a lot of time to think about why are they doing what they're doing? Can I understand the thought patterns of something whose brain literally does not contain the same chemicals as my brain? You know, you'll hear a lot of talk from people about how reptiles do not love. And that is true in the sense that the chemicals that we have that cause us to feel love, which of course the names of all of them have just gone out of my head. Um, but there's, there's a chemical your brain produces a lot of when you're in an early relationship that's the love strengthening chemical. Reptiles don't have that at all. It's just not present. But you will see iguanas, larger snakes, larger tengu, um, any of the big enough rel reptiles to have complicated brains, they form social bonds with their keepers. They form social bonds with the people they know. We've had multiple documented cases of people rescuing a crocodilian that had been injured, providing medical care to an alligator or crocodile that then became their best friend. Uh, there was a case in South America of a fisherman who ch he saved a crocodile's life, and that crocodile showed up at his door every day for 30 years. Literally never hurt him, never attacked him, never tried to bite him. There are dozens of pictures of this man just lying on this crocodile. They were best friends. How do you explain that with, without oxytocin, as Angie Long has just helpfully dropped into the chat? How do you explain that without those chemical bonds? This is an alien creature we share our planet with. It evolved here, but on a strictly biochemical rest level, it's not the same that can love us. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Beyonce may well love you. There's a good chance because she has the lifespan and the brain complexity for it. My mantises tolerate me. They will never love me. They don't live long enough. <laughs> But I have had mantises in the past where if I put my hand into their enclosure, they would just walk onto my palm. I didn't have to pursue them at all. It didn't matter if I knew where they were in the tank when I put my hand in, they would come to me. And learning that level of relation to something that doesn't love you helps a lot with learning to relate to fictional characters. Mm -hmm. They love me. They depend on me for their existence, just like my mantises do, because they are enclosed cases. If I stop feeding these girls, they will all die. No one else in this house is willing to feed them. So my, their continuity of existence is entirely my responsibility. And fictional characters are the same way. I forget people's names constantly because you do not depend on me for your continuity of existence. 
Mm -hmm. you, you don't wink out. If I forget the details of Toby's life, she winks out, she goes away. And I have such an overdeveloped sense of responsibility and empathy in part from working with reptiles and insects that I can't do that to her. The idea of taking her existence away, even though I know she's not real, I know I made her up, but I owe her a debt now because I have. Yeah. That was just beautiful. It's just been absolutely such a treat getting to hear everything that you've had to say, learn a bit more. Um, and since we, we almost have to wrap up this portion, I was just curious if there's three things that you hope we take away from this, um, either reinforcing something that, that you already let us know or uh, um, something that we didn't get a chance to talk about for each of you. Wasps are not the enemy. We need wasps very badly. Please do not just shout, kill it with fire. If well someone said. has made a moral commitment to an animal, if they have taken it into their home as a pet, it is both rude and inappropriate to respond to them posting a picture of that animal with kill it with fire. Telling somebody that you want to kill their pet tarantula or praying mantis or <sighs> someone that keeps dubia. Yes. This is me saying, I want to kill your puppy. Why people think that that is appropriate and okay, I will literally never understand. And 100% of bed bugs are created through traumatic chest rape. <laughs> you know, we could all go on Jeopardy and win now. Thank you for that fact. <laughs> oh, man. Yes. Well said. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> now you each get to do three things. All right. Not okay. make a traumatic chest rape gesture while you're doing that. Chess, <laughs> what are your three things? Oh, um... We won't survive without bugs, so put away the raid. Um, uh, if you're scared of something, learn about it. And also, aphids are horrible crop pests, but I love them and they're squishy and they have cornicles and I love them. So don't kill them horribly <laughs> and in great numbers. <laughs> That's what Jess studies, <laughs> Jess an aphid, aphidologist. Um, uh, camel spiders are the most fascinating animal, fascinating animals on the planet, and I won't hear anything otherwise. And if you'd like to learn more about them, please contact me because I will tell you everything about them. Um, uh, I think we have a great deal to learn from insects and other arthropods. Um, they have already shaped and informed what we do as as humans, and I think that that should be required learning in school um, to, to hear about how our, our cultures and our, our mythologies have been shaped by insects and, and other arthropods. And, and I'm going to reiterate, like, when you are afraid of something, learn about it, and it mm. will turn fear to fascination. And this has been really fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I hope that you appreciate it as much as we did. If you like this event and you want to see us do more, please click on the uh, donation link included in the description of the event. We really appreciate all that you're doing to join us. Um, a couple of the other events coming up, we'd like to just let you know about very quickly. We have Building Black Inclusive Worlds, a panel in partnership with FIACON. This panel will be held on Wednesday, September 23rd at 1 p.m. And if you haven't checked it out already, the FIACON weekend is coming up October 17th through 18th. Registration for our September 23rd panel is on our website. Um, another thing coming back is the Clarion West Speculative Fiction Trivia Night. It's been moved online and it's going to be held September, October 17th at 6 o'clock. Registration will begin soon and be available on our website. Our celebrity team captains this year include Shauna McGuire, Kat Rambo, Brooks Peck, Julia Rios, Crystal Connor, and more. Registration will begin soon. Get your team together and join us online. Finally, stay safe out there and take care of one another. Good night.